Hi, today we'll be talking about systematic reviews and meta-analysis. We'll begin with a few definitions. Systematic reviews involve a methodical review of evidence that systematically identifies, selects, evaluates, and synthesizes existing literature to answer a specific research question. This is different from the run of a mill review article um, that may be based on evidence, but does not set out to actually review the entire body of evidence surrounding that research question, and hence does not go through this rigorous process of systematically looking at what evidence is there out there pertaining to the topic at hand. A meta-analysis, on the other hand, um, involves pooling of data uh, and the conduct of a statistical analysis um, from these individual research studies. Meta-analysis are oftentimes done uh, as part of systematic reviews uh, when the data is analyzable, um, but meta-analysis can also be conducted um, out of the context of a systematic review. So different studies can be put together and analyzed uh, in, in, in a single um, setting, and that uh, can constitute a meta-analysis as well. So the systematic review uh, involves the following steps. Um, first, a clear clinical question has to be defined. Um, the research is then reviewed uh, and relevant studies are extracted, uh, following which the quality of the studies are reviewed um, and the outcomes are assessed, typically in the fashion of a meta-analysis, uh, and then the results are interpreted. Of note, um, along the way at the different steps, there are usually at least two uh, individuals uh, involved in the process, and this uh, helps to ensure that the process is reproducible. So the main strengths of uh, systematic review and meta-analysis um, actually come from the fact that we are taking different studies and putting them together and sort of looking, them, looking at them uh, as a single entity. Um, what this does is that it uh, augments the power, ultimately increasing the sample size, uh, and potentially it could settle controversies um, that result from conflicting results from different studies. It also facilitates um, subgroup analysis because oftentimes when we look at standalone studies, looking at different subgroups, the uh, number of participants may be too few. It increases generalizability because when we take different studies from different contexts, then potentially um, when we look at the, the totality of patients, they actually come from different contexts and hence, the results may be more generalizable. And oftentimes compared to, um, let's say doing a huge study, um, pulling the different existing studies uh, are less costly and logistically less challenging uh, as these studies have already been conducted. Limitations, however, um, would include number one, uh, that the, the quality of the, of the meta-analysis and systematic review is oftentimes contingent upon the studies that are included. Hence the concept of garbage in, garbage out. And sometimes um, the results that are pulled together and when analyzed can sometimes be inappropriate uh, when there's too much heterogeneity, which we'll talk about later on. This results in a situation where we're comparing apples to oranges and um, the statistical analysis uh, in that context may not necessarily be meaningful. There can also be publication bias and the reporting qualities across different systematic reviews and meta-analysis vary. So let's spend some time um, talking about the internal validity of um, assessing a uh, systematic review and meta-analysis. So basically, we are looking at how robust is the methodology uh, of, of the study. So firstly, we look at the criteria uh, for inclusion uh, of the studies and whether this is appropriate. We look at the search strategy what were the keywords that were used, um, what were the types of studies that were included, and what were the inclusion and exclusion criteria. Next, we look at whether the search for eligible studies was adequately thorough. So this would usually involve looking at what databases were included, um, whether there were other sources, such as uh, unpublished research, whether um, experts were contacted, whether um, conferences uh, were looked at, uh, whether non-English studies were included as well. And typically a Prisma flow diagram that would include um, all the potential studies and how the different, um, perhaps inappropriate studies were, were weeded out, resulting in, in a set of studies that were included ultimately in the systematic review and, and meta-analysis. Uh, a final part is oftentimes presented 
Um, and this is a useful tool to assess whether or not there's possibility of publication bias. The third step would be to um, look at whether or not the validity of the included studies uh, were assessed. So for example, for RCTs, this may include the use of a cocaine risk of bias tool, where basically based on different uh, parameters, uh, the different included studies uh, will, will be assessed on their um, validity on, on different criteria. And finally, as alluded to, um, when we look at whether or not the process of the systematic review and meta-analysis is reproducible, um, we want to see uh, at least two independent investigators performing each task from the search to the determination of inclusion of studies and the risk of assessment bias. So as mentioned, with regard to the funnel plot, uh, a funnel plot is a scatter plot representation of treatment effect on the x-axis and um, the measure of study size on the y-axis. Um, so typically, uh, why we can assess for publication bias using a funnel plot is because um, small studies tend to be susceptible to publication bias, meaning that uh, oftentimes if a study is small, it tends to get published because it's a positive study. So as we can see on the diagram on the right side, we may have um, asymmetry in the plot, particularly at the white part of the funnel, um, over the area where small, um, perhaps non-significant or negative studies um, are omitted. And if we tend to see such asymmetries, then we may be concerned about the possibility uh, of publication bias. When we look at results uh, in, in the meta-analysis, um, typically this is presented in the form of a forest plot that we can see uh, on the left side. So this is an example of a forest plot. So at the bottom, we usually see a summary measure um, of which the middle would usually be the point uh, estimate and the size of the diamond, usually the confidence interval of that point estimate. And the um, above data points would be the different studies that are included. So the, um, the extending lines from the, from the middle square would be the confidence interval and the size uh, of, the, of the middle square would usually um, correspond to the weight or the size of the different studies. Heterogeneity is also something that can be examined uh, for, which we'll talk about later on uh, on forest plots. And um, with looking at any of the results, we also want to consider um, what the point estimate is, what the confidence interval is uh, in terms of interpreting the results. So next, moving on to the concept of heterogeneity. Heterogeneity refers to variability among studies uh, that are included in a systematic review. So we can have clinical heterogeneity where uh, patients or rather the subjects may, may uh, be different in terms of their demographic profile, um, can be different in terms of the, the interventions that are actually being studied and the outcome measures. Uh, there can be methodological heterogeneity where the methodology in terms of the study design, um, the, the risk of bias can differ across the different studies. And these two can ultimately result in statistical heterogeneity, um, where there is variability in the intervention effects. So um, we'll talk in the subsequent slide about how we can assess for possible statistical heterogeneity. And if present, we then have to look at the clinical and the methodological components to assess where these heterogeneity may arise from. So the importance of heterogeneity um, is it lies in the fact that it may affect whether or not the results can be meaningfully meta-analyzed. Um, so what happens is that if there is too much heterogeneity or if let's say um, the studies that are included in the meta-analysis are, are too um, different, um, pulling them together and using that, that results um, into a, putting the results into a meta-analysis and uh, coming up with a single statistical determinant uh, may not necessarily be appropriate. So um, measures of, het of statistical heterogeneity include number one, a visual inspection of the forest plot. So if you look at the forest plot above, we can see that the confidence intervals generally overlap. Um, so this would be um, less concerning for statistical heterogeneity. Um, when we see different studies that have confidence intervals that are non-overlapping, uh, we then tend to worry about um, statistical heterogeneity. There are also a few statistical measures. There's an I-square statistic, 
uh, which if it's above 50%, it usually suggests uh, potential uh, substantial heterogeneity. And the Cochrane's Q chi-square test, if it's less than 0 0.1, also suggests statistical heterogeneity. So if there's statistical heterogeneity, we then have to, as mentioned, go back to the um, clinical as well as the methodological components and assess where these might be arising from. We examine the typical of the different studies. Um, we look at whether or not there are um, any particular outliers that may be causing these problems. <laughs> we, we look at whether or not um, the differences could be due to, to subgroup uh, differences and whether or not um, looking at the different subgroups uh, independently uh, may make more sense. And potentially, we may have to consider not meta-analyzing the results uh, and either qualitatively describing the results or um, either omitting or looking at certain subsets in terms of a pool analysis. But on the flip side, we also have to be cautious um, about um, instances where uh, data is excluded flippantly and uh, this may then be tantamount to data wrangling as well. So when it comes to a meta-analysis, uh, by and large, there are two main models, a fixed effects analysis model and a random effects analysis model. The fixed effects analysis model basically holds um, things to a very stringent assumption that essentially we are saying that the different studies that are included are all largely similar in terms of what they measure, in terms of their methodology. And the differences that we are seeing ultimately come from sampling differences. This results in a very precise treatment estimate and it may tend to inflate um, the overall uh, effect estimates. Um, a random effects analysis, on the other hand, um, it assumes that actually uh, there are differences that uh, may arise from sampling as well as real differences that uh, actually uh, can be accrued to the different studies. Um, hence, uh, there is assumption of heterogeneity between the different studies. Um, limitations are that it tends to be more mathematically complex and may lead to um, more inconsistent estimates. Generally speaking, most of the time, we do tend to use a random effects model uh, for meta-analysis because there usually is some heterogeneity that exists between studies um, and it generally provides a more conservative estimate compared to a fixed effects model with an overall uh, better external applicability or generalizability. So just a quick mention of two special types of meta-analysis, the individual patient data meta-analysis and the network meta-analysis. So the individual patient data meta-analysis uh, involves um, the use of indi individual participant level data uh, versus using just uh, average aggregate data uh, across different studies. So this involves essentially um, sieving out the individual data points uh, and then uh, analyzing it um, in totality, rather than we just take the different point estimates of the different studies and put it together in a model. Um, the advantage of individual patient data meta-analysis is that um, we then can subject the different data points to a similar treatment and standardization when it comes to statistical analysis. Um, and we can also then uh, identify potentially uh, raw data overlaps and, and, and remove the overlapping uh, raw data. Uh, and um, basically, we can also then meta analyze uh, specific subgroups uh, in, in, in greater precision. The disadvantages, of course, uh, come in, in, in the fact that this is very resource intensive. Oftentimes, you have to con contact the different authors and ask for their raw data. And there can be unwillingness in collaboration or non response uh, sometimes. And finally, um, a network meta-analysis uh, involves comparing three or more interventions within a single analysis. So this provides both um, sort of a relative effects uh, between the different studies as well as comparing um, the different uh, types of interventions head-to-head. Uh, -head. So this makes use of both uh, direct and indirect comparisons. Um, direct meaning from a study that compares A and B and indirect, which would involve, let's say, using uh, statistical methods to compare uh, across different um, treatment groups that are uh, across different studies. 
So this can sometimes be mathematically complex, um, but the advantage is that you can compare across different therapeutic options. And when, let's say, study A and C have not been compared, uh, but A has been compared with B and B has been compared with C, potentially you can study um, the differences between A and C. So I've come to the end of uh, this video. Hope you found it helpful.